to go kill Cody. Oh. Oh, excellent. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> this is just the subtitle. This is the subtitle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for your interest in truth and beauty. Where else than here to have that talk? And I would like to emphasize that somehow our reading project of Kuranishi structures has not been about beauty. Now I personally don't care whether a proof is beautiful or not as long as it's true. So, and since I've gotten a number of paper rejected by the reasoning that I really ought to use Kuranishi structures to deal with my figure eight bubbles, I figured I'd better understand them. And what I understand at this point is that there are good reasons why I did not understand them 13 years ago. And so I would like to explain some of those. Um, and I think it is useful, well, in general and in particular for Kuranishi structures to work with the easiest representative example. Um, so I think any regularization theory should work on the following example of g naught zero sum of widths. And in particular, right, we know we can do sum of Witten theory for like semi-positive symplectic manifold. So really the key is to do it for a general manifold, closed manifold, and not knowing anything specific about the homomorph to almost complex structure J. So, and I'm also going to, yeah, so what is, what is a moduli space of holomorphic curves, right? So here is an example for you. I've dropped zero from the subscript, so this is going to be the one point Grom of Witten invariant, hopefully at some point. So I want maps from my two sphere into M, and I'm going to fix, well, I want one marked point, but I can fix that marked point to just be infinity if I think of S2 as C union infinity. So, and then. Right, there's an A. I usually want to fix some homology class. So that's a second homology class. And let's not make it zero, so we know our maps are all non-constant. Um, we would like them to be holomorphic. And I would say that this is a space of holomorphic curves. It is not yet a moduli space because we haven't quotient it by the symmetry. So the symmetry here are, well, some group of isomorphisms. In this case, to be utterly and painfully precise, these are the Möbius transformations that fix the fitted. They should probably not both be zero, but oh well. Um, so those are the complex automorphisms of the sphere that fix infinity. And I'm writing this in that very simple form, just to yeah, make clear that although this group is finite dimensional and very simple, it will cause a lot of problems. Um, so now this guy is a 
modular space. And I know that a lot of people work with the Lynn Mumford modular spaces, so they also vary the complex structure on the underlying surface. But even if you do that, you still take up, you take a family of surfaces end maps and you end up quotienting by something. Right? Only in local slices to the Dilling Mumford space you do not quotient by subject. And so this is a representative example because even in, in any any state in any non-trivial holomorphic modular space, there is a non-discrete group X. So you would like to understand what happens with this group action in this simple example. Um, okay, and there's, well, we have a marked point, so we can evaluate our curves at that marked point. This is our evaluation map. So we're going to just evaluate it F at G of the marked curve. Excuse me? Yes. Anything. I mean, what do you take? You take the space of all complex structures on your genus G surface and maps, and then you quotient by by holomorphic into a green different complex structures. Not even the bubbles. The only so that okay. Let me let me let me rephrase my statement. The only interesting cases of holomorphic curve moduli spaces that do not have a finite dimensional group action are. Spheres with three marked points and no bubbling, or tori with one marked point and no bubbling. As soon as you have a torus with two marked points, you know you can either move the marked points around or you can move the complex structure around, and you have to quotient by something. Right? And I know that that's getting lost in a lot of papers because of the complicated notation. So I think it's worth trying to make that really clear. So, um, right. So now the question is, what? So this is this is a modular space of holomorphic curves. You know, the why, what do I mean by regular value? Um, there's going to be one line here. So the goal of a regularization is to define. In this case, the one point John of Witten invariant as, well, the places that spheres go through in my manifold. And I would like those places to form a homology class. So, you know, ideally, I would, well, Right now, this is a set. I would like the set to have some sort, some sort of fundamental class, and I can then push forward with my evaluation map. And we know that we only really expect fundamental class from compact objects, so we should compact it by this one. Um, that's this here. Um, again interesting piece of language in our field. It is not the compactification of the modular space. It is a compactification. Namely, it is the Gromov compactification. You know, they could, in theory, they, of course, you can always take the one-point compactification. There could be many other compactifications. Maybe there are some compactifications that are more useful for achieving this goal. I don't know. Um, so what this, sorry? In this particular, oh, right. Ooh, yes. OK, that is, well, that's right. Yes. It is in fact. It is in fact right. Yes, it is in fact not even a, <laughs> a compactification. Right, <laughs> you're so right. Yeah, indeed, right. It is though 
well, at least the way that when you do right. Indeed, when you when you do Gromov Witten, though, at least the image will be a compact particular field. So, no. Which is much smaller than right, but the image under the evaluation map should not be. That's true. Sh sh yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Indeed. Okay. So. Okay. So that means all that Zuzu and I are, are going to say <laughs> today is not even really going to uh, tell you how to how to do this, unless this space is at least this. But for today's purpose, let's let's assume we're at least. Yeah, and so well, actually, in, in a moment, I'm just going to completely forget about the grammar factor compactification. So I think my point today, and actually also tomorrow, is that even if you let virtual transversality techniques loose on this space, and you, in a in a case where it is compact, you get interference. Yeah. Right. But this is so, right? So certainly, whatever we do will have to make sense in a setting like this, where this this might be dead. Um, but right. So. Oh, and it has no open stratum. Oh no, this this space is empty, <laughs> right? Yeah, no smooth curves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, isolated. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad I'm staying away from that. So <laughs> it's not even a compactification in general, um, but it is compact. <laughs> so, and usually for those not so much in the know, it's something that we get from Hausdorff limits of the images of these curves, except then you have to add more. Um, so it can yeah, somehow get out the, the, meaning, the meaningful the geometrically meaningful space. Um, so, uh, right. Um, how do we reach this goal? So there's an ideal solution. Um, which would be nice if, you know, if that's what we do in the field, often we wiggle on the J. There's a contractible space of J's. And if that was a smooth, compact manifold, for generic J, um, and if these smooth, compact manifolds were cobordant, Different J's, then you know we would have a fundamental class that's well defined, and we could push that forward. So everything would be met. And this is the case in you know large classes of examples of symplectic manifolds, but it is not the case in general. And that's the question of what. So, right, so here we're regularizing by we're perturbing the J so that we get something regular. Right? Yeah. Right. 
Oh, right. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it almost feels like I'm in the audience, so that's great. <laughs> I have my alter ego, finally. Good. Um, indeed. But also, we have no tools of thinking about objects. You know, we, we don't even know how one would prove that it, it is in true in a general sense. So certainly, salt smell doesn't do it. Okay, so in general, we need you do. Of wrong dimension, yeah, right, and then and then this is not the right degree. Then this is not what we want to define. Okay, good. Um, so Kai pointed out that for generic J, the compact, the Gromov compactified linearized space actually is smooth, but of but potentially, potentially what? No. Oh, for ge right for generic J, it is not. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's that's exactly <laughs> right, right. So so that's what I mean then by an abstract regularization. And you know, I, I know some approaches don't really you know phrase this as a perturbation. Um, so this is going to be vague. Um, so somehow we want to solve something with the right hand side some abstract object mu of f um, and then there's going to be some some compactification and some equivalent class going on of maps and in order for this to have a fundamental class it should at least be a CW complex. Branched manifold, right? Yes, yes. This is something, right? Um, but for example, it should be Hausdorff. Um, so, so this by itself, I would call transversality. Right? So we're sort of picking a transverse perturbation. So we're cutting out something somewhat regular. Um, but that's not all that we want in this case, right? We want to define this from a written invariant, and so what we need is we need the push forward of whatever fundamental class or virtual fundamental class we're defining here. We need that to be independent of mu. And that's the place where clearly you you're, you're not going to even perturb finite dimensional sections in a bundle and get you know a well defined subordinate class of zero set unless the zero set is compact so um, so together this is what I would think of regularization or regularity of your modular space that's just sort of my attempt of making words to separate it. Separate two issues. Down. No, how do I get the right thing? Ah, no. Okay. Up. Down. Ah, good. Okay. So, let's see. Um, let me maybe just, since I have not so much blackboard space, um, say something. So there is what I would call a geometric approach. 
and it works by case-wise ingenuity. Um, so, you know, given your specific holomorphic curve moduli space, you figure out what you want to wiggle with. Usually it's the J. Yeah? Sometimes people like Pi have a better idea. You know? That works in some geometric settings. It doesn't work in others. Um, so, and somehow the deeper magic, if you think about this functional analytic, is that you first perturb your equation while your solution space is non-compact. And after you've gotten transversality, you actually realize that you've just got transversality for a non-compact space with a symmetry, and you just preserve the symmetry. So you've got actually variant transversality for a non-compact space. And then you quotient out, and then you compactify, yeah. which is somehow uh, Plus, you if you perturb with a J, you perturb a differential operator in highest order. Wh wh why should that even stay compact or have a compactification state? Right. So that there's you know, from from a far away point of view, if you don't know much about holomorphic curves, this is sort of fantastic magic happening. And so uh, from that point of view, it's also well, it's not so bad. I mean, you would expect it to fail at some point. And, and it does fail unless your curves are more or less injective. Um, so that's, that's what I would call the geometric approach. Um, then there's the polyfold approach that you can hear about Wednesday evening and then Thursday. Um, and we have the, all the experts in the back row. <laughs> um, and then there's you know sort of a, a large sort of a class of, of virtual moduli cycle techniques, and that's what Tusa and I set out to. Well, I asked about it because I just didn't understand them, and Tusa set out to explain them to me. And s sadly, she inherited some of the lack of understanding. But we're getting closer to actually understanding something. So. Um, Virtual regularization stay. Um, so I would say um, we mostly read Kutaya Ono's um, Gromov Witten paper, um, sort of very similar techniques in Li Qian and um, Dominic Joyce has tried to, well, put this whole thing on sort of axiomatically firmer footing and extend it far. Um, then there's, I guess, Liu Qian, similar story. And, well, uh, the approach is similar to yeah. some extent. Oh, in Oh, Liu Qian is, okay, okay, all right, good, okay. So Liu Qian becomes a polyfold approach, excellent, good. Um, and then there's, and the, yeah, so well, there's, there's the question of whether you first go to finite dimensions and then perturb, or whether you first perturb and then go to finite dimensions. So. Oh. Okay, and so this regular, this, so this is a two-step approach, and there's essentially two well theorems that would be relevant in order to reach our goal of defining one-point form of Witten invariance in general. Um, First of all, you would like to give your compactified moduli space a good structure, and we're going to call that a Kuranishi structure. Um, and then secondly, you would like any compact topological space with 
to an EC structure to have a fundamental flow. Okay, uh, it's of course not the whole truth, so to an issue structures will never be canonical, so um, maybe you leave that to cobordism. And then you need not a to an issue structure, but a cobordism class. Metrizable, probably something. Okay, so you already see that you have to add some extra words for this to make hopefully sense. And I guess, sort of, the <laughs> to me, the main research result of uh, Caesar's and mine so far is that um, in the convex span of the definitions of to an issue structures in the literature, we could not find one that satisfies either of these things. Um, so, um, and not just because of technical issues, there's some more significant issues. even for Hino's zero one-point drum of written invariant. And we believe that some of these issues we can fix. Um, but we need to both weaken and strengthen definition, the definition of two and issue structures. Um, in order to get theorem B to be something that we can prove. Um, and we also, in order to get theorem A to be something that we can prove without appealing to polyfold, um, we need to restrict ourselves pretty firmly to Gromov width. Some of that we believe we can do. And so I'm going to sort of try and, on the one hand, sort of explain how we think we can do it, but also I'm going to start with the way that, you know, it's sort of done in what I understand the literature does and why that needs tweaking. Um, yes. The extreme points would be, oh, well, okay, I just need a continuous section and a finite dimensional bundle. Okay. As old, yes. And then Joyce has a different set of conditions. So the, the, the question, so what is the regularity of the section? Smooth, continuous, differentiable, um, what do you mean by transition map exactly? Um, what, what do you mean by the co-cycle condition? <laughs> There's various versions of the co-cycle condition. Um, and um, how do you make sure you get a good finite subcover on which you can do what Caesar is hopefully going to do? Um, and yeah, sorry, yeah. Well, that's right. Right. Then, then in order to d define virtual 
from a written invariant, you'd better construct a canonical Kuranishi structure. And I'm pretty sure you're not doing that either. So, that's <laughs> um. oh yeah, that's what I mean. You know, you need some cobordism theory. So, um, and finally, I think the thing that we struggled with most is the use of germ. You know, what do you mean by a co-cycle condition when you're talking about germ? I just don't understand that. And uh, any any definition that I've tried, uh, just either we can't construct them, or we can't. E either the, the one of the theorems fails when you when at least when we try to work with germ. So, um, so yeah. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you people are aware that there are issues with multiple covered curves and also with gluing constructions. But what that a lot of people are not aware is that even if I'm assuming in this case that A is a primal sort of prime class, that a primitive class that cannot be represented by multiple cover, and there's no bubbling, even then we can't construct a Kuranishi structure easily. So, um, but let, let, me, let me say things, and then we'll, we'll see what the issues are. Um, so, um, well, a Kuranishi structure, in a sense, you should think of as an atlas. So we're going to need charts, and we're going to need the charts to be compatible. Um, so here's the idea, and this is the beginning of constructions of a chart. So, so what is my delin my not compactified, my not necessarily compact delin um, sorry, thomas witten space um, is a quotient of something. Um, so it's given by a Schwedhorn section and a Banach bundle. Um, let me be painfully precise here, let me take W2 P map from S2 to N. And personally, I like P bigger than T so that they are P1. Um, what we do will very soon fail if these are not P1. Um, if you don't like W2 P, use H3. Um, or in fact, use, you could use C1. I think that's a perfectly fine Banach space. Yeah. It just doesn't work so well once your domain stops being compact. Um, and then the debar operator loses one derivative. So this E here is a bundle of W1P section of the pullback tangent bundle, or the zero one form of those values in the pullback tangent bundle. Whatever that is, there's W2P map and there's a you know, vector bundle whose fibers are W1P map on S2. Um, and this whole section here is equivariant by a, well, in this case, not a compact Lie group, but a Lie group. Oh, no due 
beautiful setup is not quite there. Um, right, so that's pretty infinite dimensional there. And the idea is to at least locally replace this situation by a finite dimensional bundle and a finite group actor. while not bringing down the blackboard. All right. so, um, so we would like this to have a finite dimensional reduction. And again, I think we're really under sort of priv un un underappreciated this, the fact that this B group is going to get replaced by a finite B group. So I would think of it as a finite, finite dimensional reduction, since there's also a group that needs to get finite. Um, so so I would now just like to get, so I'm going to fix my F some point in my um, sum of written space. Um, and I'm just, so, right, so now I'm going to pretend that that actually is a compact space. And that is the thing that I want to make my parameter structure for. Even if it is not compact, clearly that's, I want this to be the open stratum, and I will want parameter class for it. So we're just not going to get into the gear. Um, so I would like this neighborhood in my topological space to be homeomorphic, not to the zero set of a stratum section, but to a two zero set in a finite dimensional bundle. I think that's generally understood that at least we should have a smooth structure or, or in some sense smooth structure. Um, and, and a finite group under which this whole thing should be equivariant. So we're asking for a whole lot here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. And you need enough to have derivatives along the strata. Yeah. B is some base. So this is, this is some finite dimensional bundle. So we're going to make Rn. Well, the right, clearly. Well, so whatever it is, if it's a finite dimensional manifold, we can give it locally the structure of an open set in an Rn. Mm, no. So th I think the idea, at least of Kuranishi structures, is to just let this be an abstract finite dimensional bundle. Um, and I think, well, so, so uh, let's see. So, um, so there's an abstract construction approach. Right. So you could, so again, by, by what, I, what do I mean by abstract? So if you look carefully, what it says there is, is an equivariant Fredholm section. Can we somehow make these finite dimensional reductions for general equivariant Fredholm sections? Because uh, that's so essentially my reading of Fukaya Ono is that's essentially what they're doing. Let's let me let me let me say what what I what I understand. Um, and then you can explain to me what they really do. Um, 
So and to be make it utterly simple, let me assume that the isotopy group in action in, in, in question, namely the nucleus transformations that fix my center point are just the identical. So um, yeah, and so now you open up the Toya Uno and you look at the pages where they make the construction. You forget about all Dillon Mumford, all isotropy groups, and you try to understand what it is that they're doing. And here's what I see. So I see that um, well, the fiber, this is the fiber of this abstract bundle over F, so R. Uh, Right, so obviously, so I'm already picking not just the point in my gram of written moduli space, I'm picking a representative. So, and then in that fiber, I'm going to pick a obstruction space or um, a co-kernel, a representative of a co-kernel, namely a complement of the image of the linearized G bar operator. some sense, at least, you know, let's say you put a metric on this, you could just take your perpendicular space. So there's somewhat canonical space here of the obstruction space, right? Okay. Up here. The zero section. Well, we so let's 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 agree on something. We at least want to construct this data. We might want to construct more. You're saying, okay? So we might want to construct more, but my point is that I could not even construct that. So let's. S. I think he just means S. So, yes. Namely, S. So. So the purpose of this is to get a surjective Fredholm operator, um, namely, so forget about C here for a moment, this is a tangent space to my space of maps. C maps to the linearized Casey Riemann operator on C that's in the fiber over F then, I guess. Um, and I'm going to scoop this up by adding perturbations mu from this finite dimensional vector space. Um, the problem is when I'm not quite, if C is non-zero, this does not quite fit in the fiber over F. It fits in some nearby fiber. So there needs to be some parallel transfer here that sort of depends on F and C. Right, so I don't want to even try to think about what that is. Um, Keep it in mind. Uh, 
right. Sorry. That's the the nonlinear. Ah, right. Yes. Sorry. Yes. So uh, right. So uh, right. Sorry. So so this is D of the parallel transport map. So this is. <laughs> Let's let's forget about this for a moment here. Let's let's assume it's not here. And F, right, yes. No, F F is going to be fixed charge. F is the center of my Turing group charge. So that's I'm, I'm gonna try and start with a fixed F. And so okay, let me let me say what I want to get out of this. I want to look at a second solution space, namely map U. So u will always be the varying map, and f will be sort of the center of what I start with. So my map should be w two p closed to f, um, and they should satisfy a perturbed Cauchy Riemann equation. And now is the time when I can't just write e on the right hand side, because d bar of u might be in a different fiber. So this I would like to be in some parallel um, transport from to u of the perturbative transport of f of d bar of u. Oh, so in order for this to be, I so what I would like is this, I would like this to be smooth and finite and indeed. And for that purpose, I look at the linearized operator of this equation and, well, you know, instead of putting a projection to the complement of E on the right hand side, I'm just putting U into the factors here. Um, and then I get this sort of the derivative of this parallel transport. So I mean that is not gonna matter so much. Um, you know, plug in sort of an abstract notation for some notation that makes this well defined. And the connection is something, yeah. Or another, or instead of picking just a space, you pick a sub bundle here, and then this is just the fiber of that sub bundle. Um, but the the key is because we took e to be the complement of the image of this one, this operator is actually projective here. Okay. So this is uh, transverse to zero. So that turns the relativity of some smoothness here, and we get the Fredholm index just from realizing that we added E to the Fredholm index, so the finite dimension will be the index of D bar plus the dimension or the rank of E. Of, of this one, yeah. Indeed. Um, okay. No, it's too large, right? That is that is exactly because I have done nothing to quotient by the symmetry group. Nearby maps that solve a perturbed equation. Right, so let's, let me, right, so, so the thing that we do have from this space is we have hat to E, right, that takes U and maps it to, well, D bar U, except I have to parallel transport it back, right, so that's like something. So there is at least abstractly a well-defined map here, right, and if I now take zero set of that map, 
right? Parallel transport should parallel, I mean, should move zero to zero, so should preserve zero. So that means whatever that was, if it's a bundle operation, the zero set now are just going to be the actual holomorphic curves that are WPP close to X. Um, so that means I can map these into my Sumo Nonplex set. But here, U goes to the equivalence class of U, so it's also not quite psi, I would call it psi hat. Right. And now you realize this is not going to be injected. A point here will have the whole grid parameterization all back as fiber as well. So we want psi hat to at least be injected. We wanted a homeomorphic uh, set, um, but which is still up there. So we want a psi. Um, so in Sukaya Uno, they don't actually ever write down the space, I believe. So what they do is they work on the kernel. of the linearized operator at my center point. And then they do gluing analysis, which of course you do have to do in the neural node. Um, but they somehow also do that in the interior. Um, and so um, basically, the next question you could ask is, there's a lot of hard analysis that proves somehow the implicit function theorem here, but really the upshot of uh, of this uh, gluing analysis in this sort of simplified setting is that really f is a point in B hat. This is your tangent space, and the gluing map that you're producing here from this kernel to B hat. Let me get rid of this. That's some sort of so that's for homeomorphism, no, uh, right, this is smooth, that is smooth, okay, so that's injective morphism. Um, there's some sort of exponential. Um, and so now at least we have a finite dimensional vector space that we could try and find our B in. Um, Who's who's not projective? At F. Yeah, this is going to be too big, right? Because that's just like the be so this actually is going to be the dimension of the base B that I'm going to construct. So that's exactly the effect that we want to have from Kuranishi structures, right? Since our, our linearized operator was not, o if our linearized operator was onto, we would get a Kuranishi chart where E is the trivial bundle, zero, right? where E is zero. Um, but here, right, this guy is not onto, so the kernel is too big, so we're going to take E as a co-kernel, right, and so. No, I mean the linearized operator. I mean, this is, we understand what that is, right? And I mean the linearization of this operator at the map f. Right? Th this is what people usually call g sub f. I just made up that word. <laughs> it, right, in general, I might want to, right. Yes, in, in, in general, I would, so in general, I would have to take B, F, G bar, J inverse of E. Which in this case, because I'm taking E, just for simplicity, I take E as, the co as a complement, it's, it's okay. Okay, so, um, ah, I need to take this out because so I still haven't done anything with my automorphism group, right? So I could now pull these sections back to this finite dimensional space where would, uh, my psi would still not be injected. Um, 
up. Note that my psi is certainly surjective. Right? I'm looking at all holomorphic curves that are near, right, locally surjective. Right? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. So what do we do? Well, we realize that, of course, there's some part in this kernel name that comes from the rate parameterization since I'm unfortunately only going to write that abstractly. So there's my group of rate parameterization that moves F around um, that gives me some holomorphic vector field and this transient space will fit inside that kernel. And that's exactly what I should reduce to so Sakaya Ono now says that I take the L2 perp of this. Um, and then they take a neighborhood of zero in here. So that is, I believe, what the D is. In fact, what they say is they just take this space. They take they make gluing true on some, of course, right, the exponential map doesn't is not defined on the entire transient space. So it is it's defined on a small space. Oh. So, and then they just take whatever that small ball um, is, whatever the radius of the uh, of injectivity of that in exponential map is, they just take the perp of the automorphism transient space and intersect it with that ball in which the exponential map is defined. Um, and then, okay, we have a chance at, right, so now we have a map. So we first take the inclusion here and then the exponential map and then F hat. So that gives us a section or a map between B and that vector space D. And then have F inverse of zero. Yeah, F hat maps D hat to E, <laughs> right? <laughs> saving, saving space here, right? Um, so I've just, I mean, so I've done two things. I had this sort of curvy space. I straightened it out, and then I took, I reduced all everything I do to the perp of the of the symmetry. Permutational symmetry here. Right, so I get a new zero set here. It's going to be a lot smaller than f hat inverse of zero, and I get a new map by just re restricting psi hat. Um, of course, it's including exponential map in the signal. Um, Right, the I would like to understand why that is obvious, right? So, right, I would still like to understand why that is obvious. Um, so essentially, there is a proof of injectivity in Sukaya Ono that um, in the case of no Dillon Mumford parameters reduces to no argument. I don't, I don't see that there's an argument left if there's no Dillon-Mumford parameters because they argue with the Dillon-Mumford parameters and I don't have Dillon-Mumford parameters. So I don't, know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Right, right. But I still, I still quotient it by some... <laughs> Okay, you know, I just reduce by four dimensions here. So, you know, but th that and that's that's the right dimension. So, let me I, I I'll, I'll address that question. So the other question is that they say nothing. Well, somehow they just observe what I failed to observe, namely that the image of this reduced psi is exactly equal to the image of that psi hat by definition, I, and I, I, you know, someone can explain that to me, that would be beautiful, 
Um, and then somehow the one thing <laughs> that they really, I don't, I don't think there's even a word about the psi inverse and why that is continuous. So, and all of these things follow easily if you have a local slice theorem for your axis. There at least is no obvious, abstractly true local slice. I, oh, appendix, okay, I don't, so. Still, I don't, let me, let me say what issues I have with this, right? So I want some local slice theorem for some action of this group on something. So, um, and so, the, let, let me classify the approaches in, in my mind as to how they, how they deal with this, what, what local slices they have and how they deal with this action. So, the geometric approach says, oh well, actually, right, we've already perturbed, so we're only acting on the unperturbed solution. This is a smooth manifold because we had J magic, and so this is an action of this Lie group on a smooth manifold, smooth finite dimensional manifold, and so everything is fine. So I think that's good. Um, polyfolds somehow say, oh well, I am going to work with this entire space of you know, WPP maps, and that is not true, but it is scale smooth. And we can deal with that. Um, and I think what somehow secretly at least is happening in Tsukaya Ono, is that they're assuming that G acts on G hat. At least that would explain this obvious observation that the image of psi is equal to the image of psi hat. G hat is this perturbed space here where I haven't quotient it out by the group, because the group does not act on it in general, you know? No, um, if, if, if I made this sort of parallel transport of the obstruction bundle, if I made that equivariant in some sense under G, then G would act on that, right? And that's, I think, what leads Jan do. They make an obstruction bundle that behaves well under this group action, so you actually have an action on a finite dimensional manifold. Oh, but a loc I mean, I just need a local slice. Infinitesim, uh, uh, local slice is always infinite. Okay, so infinitesimal, well, actually, <laughs> yes, I do mean a local slice because I assumed that isotropy was trivial. Yeah, so G, okay, so G times G hat does not act on, uh, yeah, okay, so, so, okay. So,
Well, but you need a very specific obstruction bundle for that. That is right, right, right. Yeah, and so that's that's somehow the point that I would like to make here is that maybe we can do it, but we cannot do it without appealing to the actual geometric setting. Oh, in the appendix. Ah, okay. Yeah, that, and that's that's exactly what I was going to say next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess, I mean, so you know, uh, at the end of the day, one of my takeaway messages, I think, well, what, what I understand in terms of comparing the different approaches is that polyfolds do not require any ingenuity on part of the user. They just require ingenuity of proof of resolved tree and framework. And, and, and learning the language and then having enough literature to quote things together. Um, whereas if you want to apply Kuranishi structures to a holomorphic curve moduli space that has not been given the structure of a Kuranishi structure, you need an idea. Um, right, yes, yes. And, and in this case, um, um, the sort of idea for, for dealing with this group action is that you need a, a sort of geometric local slice. know how I'm doing it on that. Should I just keep going? Well, let me at least write down the local slice. Um, so local slice to the action of V. So there should be, I would like this to, well, let's see. Let me just write this down here. So U approximately equal to F. And I'm going to pick hypersurfaces. equal zero and t equal to one that are both points right in C which is what which are points in my sphere. Um, and I would like this this is gonna be actually my psi. There should be um, that's gonna be a homeomorphism to my space of maps mod Mobius transformation. And what I'm yeah way I'm going to pick these, so first I'm going to you know, pick a representative f so that gf of t is injective and then I'm going to take spaces inside u little pieces of hypersurfaces in m so that t2 is, goes through f of t and is perpendicular. So F could be some fantastically evil curve. After all, we haven't regularized, but at least you know it's in some non-zero homology class. So at some point, it will actually have some non-trivial tangent space, and then the tangent space automatically has dimension two. And I'm going to pick some hypersurfaces here. And 
going to be careful that they don't intersect it again. Uh, F could be multiply covered, then I have no chance when it does intersect it again. So, um, so that's that's a good enough way to fix to have a local slice. So this is going to make analytic sense, and with that, sort of the updated D would be one where you can have functions a priori to just take things in the slice that are like close to F and not satisfy some sort of parallel transport. Again, in the construction bunch. Um, so clearly we, well, I think this is very useful. I did not get to say what actually the transition map should be between two and equal chart. Um, but hopefully, you're, so you already see that there's a little bit of issues with this group action. And we can solve it here. Um, but then when you go to actually try to construct transition maps, things get a little more dicey. And uh, I guess that's going to be my topic for tomorrow. So I'm going to try and do the same thing tomorrow and give you, maybe to make our lecture happy, I start with the right construction. Um, and then we'll see where that go gets you into trouble unless you had a good idea to begin with. Um, so homework is what is the transition map between two of these two of these local slices? And is it C1 in any infinite dimensional space? So first part is for everybody. Second part is, well, well you got to be smarter than me. I'm sure there's people that are smarter than me. Not sure they can find a set of them. Huh? No. Red is very much not finite dimensional here. Yeah. No. I mean squiggle. Which squiggle? This is W two P float. Yeah, this is a homeomorphism. Oh, oh, it's a neighborhood, of course. I well, that it remains for discussion. But I, that is my question. Can anybody give me a setting in which this is smooth? Well, I, I don't think that one can prove that there is no infinite dimensional setting. It's just that I don't know one, you don't know one. Right, but maybe there is, maybe there is a Banach space containing all holomorphic curves, at least, that on which it will be smooth. Yes. Yeah. Mapping into R N. Yeah. 
Well, so well, what I would understand is whether this construction actually gives you a smooth surface in any sense. I would like to understand whether it gives you differentiable structures on the quotient space of maps, not on the quotient space of Couture polymorphic maps. And that is, uh, you know, I mean, we've seen this at least to the, ve I mean, I think that, now I'm going to out Suza, but at some point she said, oh my God, I implicitly assumed that this transition map is smooth. Is that? So, so here's the. Uh, yeah. So I don't know what. <laughs> huh? Yes. <laughs> we need a break. Yeah. So hold hold on. Let me let me let me try and give you. Well, uh, yeah. So, so the reason I want this transition map is that when in making, right? So I could use these two local slices to make a Kuranishi chart around F zero and a Kuranishi chart around F one. Right? And now I want to argue why they are compatible. And in order to make them compatible, I do something like a sum chart in which I need to sum the two obstruction bundles. And I need to make a larger sort of perturbed space of perturbed polymorphic curves where instead of just one obstruction bundle here, and since I have a, a sum of obstruction bundles, there's something slightly larger than that sum of obstruction bundles. But I do need to give this space a smooth and in order to do that, I don't know how to do that other than to write it as a Fedholm operator. And in writing it as a Fedholm operator, I'm implicit, I'm, I'm working in an infinite dimensional setting, and these transition maps come into that setup of the Fredholm operator that, that cuts out the sum chart. Right. Well, I would like this, okay, so hold on. I would like this to have this, a structure of a s smooth finite dimensional manifold. Yes. Yeah. Yes. On this space here. But once I try to put so what I'm trying to say is once I try to put D, well, I mean, there's a map here, right? So, yeah. So eventually we would like to take E plus E0 plus pullback of E1. So, so this gamma here does appear in the Fedholm operator that cuts out this space. Right. Okay. We should get. Yeah. 
That's the yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You have to be smart. That's that's that, that's all I want to say is probably there's a way of making Peronesian structures for all the holomorphic curve spaces that we want them for, but you have to be smart. You know, you, you can't just say as you will. So that's um, and and you have to have coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you.